It is now time for member statements. Order, please. Order, please. Order. Member statements. I turn to the member from Toronto St. Paul's. Our Toronto St. Paul's need safe and frequent public transit, not less. Instead, this government is threatening to cut four bus lines, 5 Avenue, 33 Forest Hill, 14 Glencairn, and 142 Avenue Express, used by many in my riding, including seniors, students, child caregivers, essential workers, and disabled residents trying to get from point A to B safely during a pandemic. I thank community members like Mike, who volunteers with TTC Riders, placing signs to save our bus routes all across our neighbourhood, Jerry, an ageing adult, Carla and Anthony, who I recently met near Oriel Park, for sharing their grave concerns about losing these bus routes. Speaker, contrary to popular belief, not everyone on Avenue Road or in Forest Hill is pushing a Bentley. Ontario's largest transit agency, the TTC, is projecting a $700 million budget shortfall by the end of 2020. It is time for the Premier and his Conservative government to step up and address our public transit funding crisis, permanently invest in transit operating costs so we can have more buses, more drivers in St. Paul's. We need to be able to practice social distance safely when we board our buses, Speaker, to keep ourselves and others safe. This Premier's priority should be improving public transit, not increasing the salary of wealthy CEOs like Metrolink CEO Phil Vester by 35 per cent, while my constituents can't board a safe bus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, government members, uh, please come to order. I'm having difficulty hearing the members who are making their statements, further statements. Recognize the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. One thing we've learned in the current context of COVID-19 is the importance of places for outdoor recreation. And while my riding of Niagara West is best known for its parks and its trails, I was happy to also join local municipal leaders, volunteers, and residents this past Saturday for the grand opening of Rotary Park in Beansville. The new park features a skate park and a pump track, the first pump track in Niagara, that is sure to provide hours of recreation and physical activity for the growing number of young families and youth in the green space near the Fleming Centre in the heart of Beamsville. The park provides an outdoor complement to the indoor track, arena and library next door. Public consultation for the project, facilitated by the Town of Lincoln, began in 2018 and it confirmed the widespread support for the park that I've been hearing. I want to thank the Rotary Club of Lincoln, Lincoln Uptown Skateboard Park Association, and the Town of Lincoln for all their work to build the park. Of the many sponsors and community drivers of this unique project, I would also like to acknowledge Reverend Walter Mittler, uh, who was the inspiration for the skate park, as well as Sue Foster, the pre past president of the Rotary Club of Lincoln, and local skateboard and cycling enthusiasts Trevor Donegan, Adrian Penichetti, and Nick Halkius. On your 50th anniversary, of incorporation, congratulations to the Town of Lincoln on your new skate park and pump track. Thank you. And if I could ask all members to please listen to the statements that we're making at this time, I turn to the member for Toronto Danforth. I'm, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I, there's no resemblance whatsoever. <laughs> Davenport. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians are watching with horror as COVID makes its way back into our long-term care sector. The Fairview Nursing Home in my riding of Davenport has the largest outbreak in Ontario right now, with 50 residents, about half the patients, and 22 staff infected, at least two tragic deaths. My thoughts are with their families and everybody who cared for them. For essential caregivers, those family members who support their loved ones every single day, there are real concerns that a lack of access to testing will keep them from providing that care or is going to shut them out altogether. My constituent, Mary Oko, is an essential caregiver for her mother, Wanda, at Copernicus Lodge and has struggled with long waits at assessment centres. Today, she finds herself on an endless waiting list to get into a pharmacy for a scheduled appointment. Irene Gabonet's mother is also a long-term care resident, and Irene is her essential caregiver. She's experiencing the same challenges. Irene and Mary have a simple suggestion. Let's move asymptomatic essential caregiver testing into the long-term care homes where regular testing of staff and residents is already happening. Mr. Speaker, this is already underway in the Glebe home in Ottawa. I call on the government to act now. 
prioritize the testing of our essential caregivers and do whatever it takes to ensure our elders get the support and care they deserve and so greatly need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member Statements. The member for Ottawa Banyan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With roots in Indigenous celebration, celebrating Thanksgiving long predates the arrival of settlers in North America and can look very different across the country. This weekend, Thanksgiving celebration will look even more different than usual. Given the rise of cases of COVID-19 in Ontario, it is safest for all of us to restrict our festivities to our, our immediate family. And I want to thank Ontarians for putting safety above all and doing their part in fighting this pandemic. Regardless of how we celebrate, giving thanks is especially appropriate right now. Pour ceux d'entre nous qui pourront prendre plaisir Those of us who will be able to share a meal with their families, let's, uh, let's be thankful. Many people, many people of our communities uh, have a hard time putting food on the table. Food, it's very difficult even for food bank organizations. No one should suffer from insecurities related to food. On what we as MPP can do better to support the people in our communities that are in need. So happy Thanksgiving to all who will be celebrating this weekend. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member Statements, Member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, as a lover of various music genres, Chatham, Kent has been home to many aspiring artists. I remember back in the early 1970s, the success of Ian and Sylvia Tyson had as Canadian folk and country music singers. Their greatest hit was Four Strong Winds, and in 1992, they were inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Another Chatham artist who had a successful career in the country music field was Michelle Wright. She is one of the country's most widely recognized and awarded female country singers of the 1990s. And she was inducted into the Canadian Music Country Music Hall of Fame in 2011. But Speaker, I would be remiss if I didn't mention yet another young and talented female artist from Chatham. This young lady started singing in church at an early age and continued to pursue her dreams. Now she is a Canadian worship leader and songwriter. She's been named Female Vocalist of the Year by the Canadian Gospel Music Association for three straight years. In 2020, her latest album, Pursue, with the hit song, The Darkness Doesn't Scare Me, and her album's title track, Pursue, resulted in her being a 2020 Juno nominee. She's married to a highly talented and accomplished music producer, Stephen Lensing, speaker, I've known this young woman my entire life. All of us, you know, like all of us, rather, she's enjoyed the good times, but has persevered through the dark times, relying on her faith to help her get through. This beautifully talented and hardworking woman, speaker, is my daughter, Brooke Rebecca Nichols. Thank you. And oh, by the way, speaker, she and her husband are expecting their first child in February. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations. Member statements. The member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, it's Thanksgiving week and coming up, and Thanksgiving is traditionally a time when families come together and celebrate. And this will be a much different Thanksgiving. And I uh, hope that everyone will act responsibly and protect themselves and protect others. But there's one thing that isn't different this Thanksgiving than any other, is the food on the table will be brought to you by the agricultural sector, by all the people. In the and the week before Thanksgiving is uh, Ontario Agriculture Week, a week when we celebrate the agriculture sector. And we all talk about farmers being hard work, and they are. They're incredible people. But they're part of uh, a whole chain. 
and we have to remember the whole chain. We have to remember people like the vets who show up at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning. If there's a cow that has to have a calf and the farmer can't do it, I'll buy his self or herself. We have to remember the mechanics who sometimes show up at night to do something. And this year, we have to remember the migrant worker who picked the vegetable that's on your table. Give thanks, give thanks to them all. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements, the member for Scarborough Centre. Speaker, I would like today to commemorate Ahi Day, which is celebrated around the world on October 28th each year. We will not hold a parade on the Danforth this year, but this does not make this day any less significant. Ohi Day commemorates the rejection by Greek Prime Minister Ioannis Metaxas of the ultimatum made by the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini on October 28, in 1940. We were up against a mighty enemy, but we were brave. We stood on that day virtually alone in the world against the unseemingly unstoppable Axis forces. President Roosevelt said, when the entire world had lost hope, the Greek people dared to question the invincibility of the German monster, raising against it the proud spirit of freedom. Churchill said, let us not say that Greeks fight like heroes, but that heroes fight like Greeks. Greece's victory over Mussolini changed the fate of the world. I am so proud to be a Greek Canadian and to call this my heritage. Greeks will always stand against tyranny. We will always stand for freedom, and we will always stand for true democracy. Democracy and freedom are always frail, but Greece's history as a force for them assures me that they will always persist and that Greeks all over the world will always fight for them. We will always say no to those who challenge freedom. And as a proud member of the Greek diaspora, I am so proud to be raising my own little Greek Canadian warriors for democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Speaker, housing is a human right, not only here in the province of Ontario, but across the world. But unfortunately, in many communities, we are seeing an increasing rate of homelessness, and the pandemic has simply made that worse. In Peel, in the city of Brampton, we see our numbers increasing and people being forced into unsafe and illegal housing options. Where is the relief, Speaker? Where is the relief for tenants and small to medium landlords? They have been asking this government for support to assist in the underlying issues that they're facing. I've spoken with many tenants who have shared with me harrowing stories about the reality of the housing that they are subjected to. One tenant shared with me that bed bugs are dropping from the ceiling into his bed and onto his clothes. Another tenant shared with me that roaches are entering the food that they make for their family and their children. Speaker, it's really unfortunate that in a province as rich as ours that Liberal and Conservative governments have failed to invest in housing to ensure that people have adequate options and, and a safe place to call home. So I'm urging this government to think about what we need to do to make sure that everyone has access to a safe and affordable place to rest their head at night. Think about options like rent relief, a rent bank, because it's not just tenants, it's landlords that also need support, and this government has failed to step up and support anybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 360 Kit is a nonprofit organization that has served the vulnerable youth of York Region for over 30 years. I had the opportunity to attend an event organized by 360 Kids where I had the experience to spend overnight on the street on snowy night and connect with youth and adults who were without a home. The event was an eye-opening experience for me and the program and service 360 Kids are changing and impacting lives every day. Mr. Speaker, last week, I was delighted to join 360 Kids as the organization in partnership with Markham in the Church Committee for Affordable Housing and funding from our government's Ontario Trillium Foundation Growth Fund. Announced permanent housing for two bright youth in their newly constructed apartment. During this 
units after and seeing how they are appropriately furnished and equipped. I'm proud of 360 Kids' efforts in making this youth feel welcomed, safe, and comfortable in a place they can call home. Through the Ontario Trillion Foundation's growth grant, it will support the organization's transition in housing program, which aims to provide basic needs and more stable housing options and guidelines for vulnerable youth between 16 and 29. I want to thank 360 Kids and, and the vital role this organization plays in Markham Unionville and surrounding communities. Thank you, Mr. Member statements. The member for member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. I rise to recognize the 25th anniversary of Bethesda House, a local shelter for women fleeing violence in my riding of Durham. In 1995, with the support of St. Vincent de Paul Society, donations from the Clarington community, and I might add support from the former MPP for Durham, John O'Toole, a small shelter for women fleeing violence opened its doors in Bowmanville. The original intent of Bethesda House was to support victims of domestic violence. However, over the years, they've grown into an agency providing a wide range of services and supports to women, youth, and children who are dealing with all types of gender-based violence, including but not limited to domestic violence, sexual assault, elder abuse, familial abuse, cultural violence, and human trafficking. Speaker, we recognize that during the pandemic, when public health officials have been encouraging Ontarians to stay home, home is not a safe place for everyone. I want to thank Bethesda House for continuing to be there for women facing violence during this time of crisis. They've continued to provide their essential services and support, and their trained counsellors have been taking calls around the clock. Speaker, I had the chance to visit Second Chance this past weekend, Bethesda House's new and gently used clothing store, and hear the story of how it began 25 years ago, starting as a small room in the shelter to help meet the practical needs of women they serve. That's now on the main street of Bowmanville. I want to congratulate everyone who's been involved, including Executive Director Jackie McKinnon and her whole team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our member statements for this morning.